So without any more ado, I'm going to hand you over to Maya. Thanks very much, Maya. Thanks, Audrey. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, uh, as Audrey said, I'm based in Shetland and it is grey here today, but it's not raining yet. So uh, we always look on the positive side here in Shetland. Um, yeah, so my name's Maya. Um, I've got a background in fine art filmmaking and film preservation. And also for the last four years, I've worked with community groups in the north of Scotland, looking at preservation and access of their audio visual collections. Uh, so today I'm going to very briefly walk you through the process of digitizing audio visual material, um, things to think about before, during and after a digitization project. Um, I'll also provide some great examples of projects utilizing digital material. And I will be sending also a handout later with lots more links, just because, as Audrey said, um, we do have limited time and there is a lot of detail to go into. So before doing anything, I think it's really important to think about why you're digitizing your material. Um, so this will help you plan a project, give it purpose. So rather than saying we want to digitize things to make them accessible, be specific. Um, we want to digitize these two films about Lerwick sailing regattas so that we can screen them at the boating club's centenary celebration, for example. Um, two things to remember, um, digitization is not preservation in and of itself. Digital items require preservation to remain accessible. So um, digitization is not the end of a process, it is the start of a process. And also um, digitization does not automatically mean accessible and undigitized mean inaccessible, yeah? So digitization, um, sorry, access is an approach. You have to have a plan for access. It doesn't just happen because you've digitized something. Before digitizing, it's really good to know what you have. Um, obviously, the more information you have, the better decisions you can make about what and how to digitize your material. So um, we're going to talk through the three C's, which are carrier, content and condition. So carriers um, are the way the images and sounds are stored and conveyed to us. So we have celluloid film strips, which can carry sounds and images together and separately. Tapes as well, um, so magnetic tape can also carry images or sounds, um, and you might find this in cassettes such as the VHS or Betacam, um, but also on open reel. Um, and this, such as uh, CDs and DVDs, actually carry digital med media material, um, but because of the nature of these items and the fact that CD and DVD drives are less common, uh, now means you should also consider migrating this material um, to other storage systems. So just a quick note about film. Um, nitrate film stock is very flammable and is dangerous. Um, it was produced until about the 1950s and it's almost entirely all 35 millimeter. So um, the image on the right here you can see and that would be the width of the film. Um, small gauge film stocks like the 60 millimeter image on your left are very unlikely to be nitrate and that's in the UK. So you should definitely check advice from your own geographical area. Um, China and the USSR did make small gauge uh, nitrate film stocks for a time. Um, I'll include a link as well to the health and safety executive leaflet on nitrate film, which will tell you what to do if you think you have this material in your collections um, and also local councils can um, advise on uh, storage or disposal if necessary. Um, you want to think about the condition of your material. So a visual inspection can tell you a lot. Um, some common things to look out for are mold on both tape and film. Um, Vinegar syndrome, named after the smell, indicates acetate film is starting to deteriorate. And um, sticky shed syndrome, um, which is, affects tape, um, is when the binder holding the magnetic element of the um, tape to the plastic 
start to deteriorate. So um, these can both be slowed, but can't actually be stopped. So um, do have a look out for these signs. And if possible, separate out this material from um, material that's still in good condition. Um, and the handout will provide lots of uh, guides on um, conservation, but also ways you can deal with these issues. And then crucially, of course, you'll want to know the content of your material, what's on it and is it worth digitising? So again, a visual inspection can be useful. Um, for film, you can unwind the reel a little and on a clean surface and with clean hands, you don't need gloves, um, use it and use a light source as well. So um, I use a sad lamp here, which costs about £25. Um, you can have a look at your film um, use a magnifying glass or loop if uh, that's helpful as well. Um, as well as uh, the images on the film, you can also start getting a lot of technical info from um, an examination. So you can, by looking at these um, symbols on the edge of the film, you can uh, identify the year of production of the film, which can help date your film. Um, and then also a really important point um, between Super 8 and 8 millimeter, um, you can help identify this through the positioning of the sprocket holes in relation to the images. Um, again, I'll provide the handout provides lots more links to identifying film and tape. Obviously, with tape and disc carriers, it's a bit more tricky to identify what you have. So um, some items may have text on them. Um, which can be useful, but obviously don't assume this is accurate. VHS tapes can and have been recorded and used over and over again. If you have equipment to play these items, you may decide you're happy with the risk of playing them to see what they contain. Um, do have a look at the equipment you're using as well to make sure that's in good condition and clean it if necessary. Um, an alternative is to get a low resolution copy, digital copy made, which will cost less than a high resolution um, transfer. Um, obviously that's, that is money, um, but I would try your absolute hardest to avoid digitizing items. If you don't know what's on them, you may spend a lot of money and time on material that actually isn't very useful to your organization. So that may seem like a lot of things to do before even you start digitizing, um, but it's really important. They can help you make decisions about what to digitize, um, but they can also help you uh, raise awareness and funds and support from your community. So um, this is an example from the Found Archive in North Uist in the Outer Hebrides, who used lots of the information they had to launch a crowdfunding campaign to raise money to digitize material. Um, and the more you can tell people, ideally with some really appealing pictures, um, the, the more effective I think this is. So obviously having said that, make sure you're recording all this info you've uh, found out. Um, it will be helpful to you in prioritizing your um, items for digitization um, and also useful if you seek quotes for digitization as well. Um, really useful to remember is that both your original copies and your and when you've made them, your digital copies will also need item numbers. So think about how you're going to record the relationship between the two items. This is an example from the Shetland Film Archive, just our working um, uh, table of digitization items and, and where they're at. Another thing um, to think about is um copyrights in the material so obviously don't digitize anything you don't have the rights to use that would be again a waste of time and money for material that isn't home movies or personal or history recordings for example um it might be also be worth checking it hasn't already been digitized um by either like a local or national archive or by another community group um you may also need to look back on acquisition or loan agreements because digitization offers new opportunities for use of material and these may not have been covered in older agreements. So this is um, 
an extract from the Shetland Film Archive Agreement. They talk through potential uses with donors and get permission for these. Um, if you cannot realistically make use of the material available, you know, you have to ask yourself some questions about why you might digitize it in the first place. Uh, regardless of rights, I also think it's respectful to let donors know if possible what's happening to their material. Um, and this is especially true of sort of home movies or, or history recordings, because it's quite a personal thing. Um, obviously, what's great about digitizing your material is that you can offer a copy back to your donors if they don't have one already. So hopefully you've got all your information collected um, and you'll be able to sort of make start making a priority list for your digitization. Um, just a final point on this then, older is not necessarily the most at risk. Um, magnetic tape and early digital media items are actually currently considered the most at risk media types. Um, film, uh, given appropriate passive preservation conditions and provided it doesn't have vinegar syndrome, will be okay for a bit. So you'll need to think about balancing content and its value against at risk carriers in your planning. Once you've decided what material you want to digitize, you have a few more things to consider. Do you want to outsource it or do you want to uh, try and digitize in-house? There are a few things there. So um, costs, both have costs. Um, and do you have time as well is a really important one when you're at, um, digitizing in-house. Do you have time to do that? Obviously equipment and skills and knowledge are really key to that. Um, whether you have that expertise within your community or um, can, can enlist people or have time to learn it, it can be a really fun thing to do. Um, but yeah, these are things you'll have to work through. Again, what um, risk are you willing to accept? So obviously um, commercial preservation and digitization companies will have lots of experience and will probably be able to minimize, minimize risk, although there will always be risk, whereas um, that risk might be higher if you're doing it yourself. So um, outsourcing. There are a few digital, a uh, few commercial companies that offer audio visual digitization services. These are some in the UK. Um, the first three I have worked with and have, they've worked with community archives. Um, so that, that's been really great. Um, they've had good relationships um, with those companies. I don't have any personal experience of Townsweb, although that has had recommendations as well. Um, and of course, there are other places, um, your local archive or your local moving image archive or even your national moving image archive might be able to recommend some places as well. Um, do talk to these companies. Um, talk to a few companies as well, if you can, and just see what kind of response you get. Um, some are very enthusiastic and very helpful. Some um, might be, you know, digitizing a large collection for the Science Museum or the VNA and and not be interested, say, in just a couple of reels of film or something like that. Um, having information about these collections, your collections as well, will help you get sort of an accurate quote um, and also, you know, help the the company understand what you have and, and what kind of time it will take for them to do it. Um, you'll also need to think about what the digital file you want at the end of the process, but um, I'll talk about that shortly. So the other option is um, doing things in house. Um, there are lots of guides online that can give advice and walk you through this process um, and I'll provide lots of links for that. So don't rule it out. It totally is a doable option. The um, Unlocking Our Sound Heritage Project in the UK, which is brilliant, really great team of people, particularly the team in Scotland who are um, really helpful, um, have produced these two zines about digitising cassette tapes and ripping CDs. Um, so these will talk you through the audio digitisation process. They'll explain audio frequencies and sampling rates if you're interested. Um, uh, and I'll provide obviously a link to those. Um, it's also uh, viable to digitize VHS tape yourself. 
there is particular equipment you need to do this. Um, I'll provide some links again to kind of setups and things like that. But you can see this is a, the setup the Florida State University Library uses. Um, it's not impossible. That's that's all equipment you can obtain yourself. And it can be really fun to learn and test these things out. I would say if you're doing it for the first time, um, obviously do it with material, um, particularly tape material that um, isn't you know, vital or the only copy and things like that. So as I said before, we want to think of our outputs that we want, our digital files. So ideally you want to capture as much information from your original items as possible. Um, so for preservation purposes, you may, you'll want your digital copy to be uncompressed and the some codecs and file formats for audio and video um, preservation are noted here. Um, you may often see ProRes files also, um, used as preservation quality files, and they are visually lossless, but they're still compressed. Um, it's really important to keep a completely unaltered high quality. And when I say high quality, I mean the highest quality you can afford because these things cost money, obviously. Um, preservation master file. Um, so you don't change this, you don't alter this in any way. You make copies of this, if you need to change anything or you need to make access copies or add watermarks or anything like that. Um, so obviously just remember to keep track of these in a sort of content management or catalogue system. Um, so you are not accidentally uh, doing something to your preservation master file. Uncompressed files are large and you'll want to make compressed access copies to use or showcase online or at your heritage space. Um, so there's uh, options for compressed files are also noted here. Um, try to avoid proprietary file formats um, that only play on certain systems. So um, Windows media player file formats and things like that. Uh, for digital, digital um, moving images copy uh, digitized from celluloid, you may want to also think about the frame rate. So contemporary moving image material runs at 24 or 25 frames per second and films that are silent, which a lot of small gauge films are run at, may run, may run at 16 or 18 frames per second. Um, I've also provided here a uh, sort of comparison of file sizes of a four minute, eight millimeter film um, but the diff you can see the differences in size between the preservation and access copies. Um, this brings me on to storage. So once your material is digitized, you'll need to think you'll need to store it somewhere. And ideally, you should be thinking about that before you start digitizing it. Um, you'll also need to think about file management um, of these of this material. So. Um, for digital files, the three to one rule is a really good one to follow. This involves geographical separation and also different storage media. So um, don't keep all your material on one spinning disk hard drive. Um, don't keep it on two identical spinning disk hard drives in the same place. Split these up, um, store them at different people's homes or store a copy on the cloud, that kind of thing just so that if anything happens to one set of media or one hard drive or anything like that, you've got backups. You'll also need to think about digital maintenance and preservation. So firing up those spinning disk hard drives, performing checksums on your data. Uh, don't forget about those original items either. Um, do store those correctly. You don't need anything fancy for this. You can store them in your home um, unless Obviously, don't store that nitrate there. That needs to be dealt with properly. Um, this is a really useful guide from the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, and I'll provide a link to that, but um, it'll tell you good places within homes to store media and um, the orientation as well. So finally, most importantly, I think, why are we doing all this? We're doing this so we can make amazing audio visual material accessible, and digital offers lots of opportunities to do this. Material um, from the 
community and volunteer-led Shetland Film Archive was used as part of a theatre production here in Shetland a few years back, um, projected on screens as part of the set of a play. And you can see an image of that in the top left. Um, material from the Shetland Film Archive and the Found Archive in the Outer Hebrides, also a community archive, um, was used as part of a music residential programme for students on the um, University of the Highlands and Islands Applied Music programmes. Um, and the students wrote and then uh, composed and publicly performed accompaniments to these silent films. So that was a really fun project we worked on. Um, and then just the Christmas just gone, um, my friend and I put together an audio video trail along the high street in Lerwick. Um, so TVs were positioned in shop windows and people could view the films as they walked by. So this was again a really great thing to do in a sort of socially distanced COVID safe way when screenings weren't a viable option. Um, of course you can have regular film screenings um, but I do think it is these the potential of these creative opportunities that make it really exciting to digitise a um, audiovisual material and to be obviously um, we can use it therefore in ways that would have been very difficult on their original uh, carrier formats. So just to summarise, I realise I've thrown a lot of information at you there. Don't be overwhelmed, don't be scared, yeah? Just take your time, re-watch this, read through the um, handout I'll send and uh, just start with those little steps and like working out what you've got and what you want to digitise. Um, take your time as well. Um, these media have waited many years probably, they can wait a few more months. Don't do it all at once. You can do little bits at a time. Don't do it alone. There's a community here today who are all interested, hopefully. Um, and there's lots of people online also trying to deal with these same things. So do seek out those communities. And I've put some links to um, useful resources as well. Um, do a bit of research as well. Um, look to see if several more, one or more sources agree on a process or software before embarking on it. So if, if five people are all going, this process works, I found it really easy. That's that's much more reliable than one person saying, oh yeah, you just do this. And just finally as well, don't wait for the perfect system or the perfect time or the perfect software. That will never exist. Um, we might have to settle for good enough, um, especially with community archives where I'm very aware there's limits on time and money and skills and expertise, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't give it a go. And I'm really happy to talk to people um, about digitizing this material um, as well, if you have any questions. Um, so I'm just finished on, if you want to see some digitized uh, material, the Shetland Film Archive are doing a screening on YouTube and Facebook tonight. Um, uh, and this is material from the 1950s and 60s, recently digitized, and this will be the premiere of that. So do tune into that if you want to see um, what's possible with a community-led archive project. And that's me. So I will stop sharing and uh, await your questions. That's fantastic. Thank you, Maya. Um, I just want to say we do ask our, our speakers for these events which are aimed at community archives and heritage groups to give practical advice and Maya you have certainly ticked that box with lots and lots of really useful and helpful information there. Um, you have referred to the uh, links and I will send that out um, later today with a recording of this um, session. Um, and also it will include a feedback form. So if you could just um, fill that in so we could provide more training a bit like this um, on subjects that you want to hear about and what are of use to you as well. What do you want when we do a training session? I have a couple of questions actually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go to the Q&A function bar first. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee, so I don't know who that is. But it's about copyright and it says, if copyright on old material is unclear, what would you recommend? Can you suggest sources that might give advice on how to approach this? Um, well, obviously it depends very much on the material, but um, there are different ways to deal with that. 
firstly there's if it's um you know newsreel stuff or or, or perhaps more feature film like things um you can do a lot of research online um, and i'll put in some links to starting places for that um there is a thing a, such as a, something called a takedown notice which is used by a lot of institutions and what this means is you can if you've done your best to find um, copyright owners um, and you can evidence that you can put material online or, or display it with uh, uh, sort of um, information saying if you if the person who comes across it you think you are a copyright owner in this please get in touch and we can take this down and obviously begin discussions with you it is actually very useful in some ways to put material out there because actually you might find copyright owners through that so I think it's always just about being um, respectful and and opening up a dialogue with with copyright owners if you can't ascertain that so just being like we, we actually don't know who this is but if if anyone does please um please come and tell us and I think it's not being scared of those um it, but again that depends on the material so much but anything made by a company or anything with logos on it that kind of thing it's going to be there is going to be copyright in there somewhere so I know we've had that discussion before actually and, and I think it was really good advice when you say obviously if it's sensitive material mm. and that could be if, if you think that the person who's in the, the film wouldn't like to be seen um because it's an embarrassing situation or something like that best to avoid it but at the same time you do want to get things out there um and and you have to wait to get the response back if someone has a problem and of course you would take it down and you can put that notice on your mm. website or your Facebook page or whatever yeah. can you? And, and I'd say you know that's like big institutions use that the British Library uses that as a as a system when they don't know so it's not it's not an unacceptable um solution um and yeah certainly the sensitivity you know just think if I was in that position would I want that made public mm -hmm. um also to be aware especially with like sort of home movies or um or or, or audio recordings you know those people may have passed away there may be that kind of sensitivity involved so um it can be really wonderful when you connect those people again but but also there can be sensitivities involved so sometimes it is just a case of going are you okay with this and most people i've i've very rarely come across any issues if i'm honest as long as you're engaging with people they're really happy that you ask most of the time great um, I'm going back to the chat room here uh, and I'm going to ask a question from Robert who is about storing tapes and he wants mm. to do you store tapes on on end horizontally or vertically have you any advice about that yes so you'll store them upright like that Does that make sense so um films are flat video is upright great but uh, the um the link to the handout as well i'll send that um, gives you lots of places best places to store them in in your in your room and things like that as well okay i'm going back now flipping back to the q a bar here um and this is from emma skinner uh thanks maya that was a great presentation um i have to agree with you there emma it really was i have a question regarding the difference in storage space between preservation and master and access copies mm. you had the figures in your slide for film i wondered if on i wondered if off the top of your head you had an equivalent for sound files from a standard 90 minute cassette tape not off the top of my head but i would recommend um that zine i talked about from the unlocking sound heritage um team who uh they go into a lot of detail about um cassette tapes so there will be a link to that in the handout but it's the it's the bright pink one i had the image of um and they're much more i i generally deal with moving images although sound is part of that but they're much more experienced with that um i'm not sure where emma is but um audrey will back me up on this the team in, in scotland working on the unlocking sound heritage are really helpful if you've got any questions like that yeah they are the, the people and i can send that link as well we mm. have very close relationships with um the national library of scotland and unlocking your sound heritage. histories yeah yeah um so 
slightly off, but I think this is a very interesting one, Maya. Um, it's tips for preserving pictures and videos which have been on a phone for the last seven years. Mm, yes, this is exciting. And I only touched upon it. I like this one. Yes. <laughs> as, as I said, yes. So digital, digital, uh, early digital media is actually very much at risk because we always think our phones will be there or um, I'm sure some many people have hard drives they haven't looked at in four or five years um, so the I would recommend the Digital Preservation Coalition um, have tons and tons of advice I've provided a few links to them but um, you can just google them uh, they have tons of advice on all things digital so any anything from emails to uh, digital images to um, anything really. Um, they're really great at that and they they provide lots of breakdowns. They also have a really great um, program that they're running at the moment with the National Archives called, um, I think it's called Novice to Know How, which um, goes through a lot of digital preservation stuff. So you can actually sign up for that as well. Um, but my main thing would be to get them off the phone or the camera wherever they're stored and um, because you don't know how long you'll have access to that device um, so if you can get them either by a cable or by sending them um, to a computer and then obviously onto uh, various into the cloud or onto a storage external hard drive or something like that that's a really great start so even if you don't do anything else to those files at that point you've got them off the, the phone that might not turn on in a few weeks time or a year's time. So. Yeah, I think that is. Someone was asking about the digitization of say flat objects and photographs. Mm. We covered that last week just to let people know. So um, we'll get the recording out to you um, and I think you'll find that useful. So uh, with this series, we have broken down the types of objects to digitize. Um, so today Maya's talking about sound and film, but next week we're actually looking at 3D objects. So that could be um, anything from a, a book or a, an object in your collection, but it, it could also mean something like outside, like rock art, or a, a, you could go to the interior of a building. So that's maybe, that's mm. next week. Um, but getting back to this, I just wanted, I'm, I'm scrolling through this, um, it, it's about, would you recommend using Dropbox as one of your storage options, Maya? So recommendations are very difficult because um, in terms of what you can afford to, if you can't, you know, Dropbox has a free option. Mm. Um, so if you can't afford to pay for a, a system, that is an option. I. I'm not sure entirely of their um, size limits. They do have quite a low um, amount you can store for free. And obviously audio and visual, audio and um, moving image files take up quite a lot of space, even the access copies. So that's something, that's why I just mentioned thinking about storage ahead of time is that um, you will need something that you can use that will have a lot of space. Um, I think uh, I'm always a bit wary of recommending different things, but um, the I know the group, some of the community groups I work with use Vimeo to store their audiovisual assets. So you can have these as a private thing, so it's not about making them accessible, um, but that is a paid for service. So again, it's about what you can afford. Yes, because there was problems with uh, my Space, I believe a lot of people used this it was free and then they decided not to run it anymore and people lost all their information which tended mm -hmm. to be uh, recordings of songs um, rather than films and uh, yeah many groups actually ended up it was their only way of backing up so I think we go back to this idea of you know you could use something like Dropbox but definitely you've got to store it on at least two other yeah. devices yeah so your um, th the three two one rule is is um just a good one to have in your head so if you do choose to use dropbox i you know i'm not i i'm not going to recommend or 
not recommend that it's it's a choice but just make sure you you're putting that material elsewhere as well um ideally not on a online format so mm -hmm. as well um but yes absolutely just be aware these these um platforms can disappear at any point you don't you know you don't have con necessary control when a um a company decides to shut something down um so but there's lots i would like to say there's lots of digital archivists out there trying to um was it is it was it uh, uh there was one of those sort of ask uh, not ask you some some old search engine um so they were harvesting all the questions people had asked so that data is trying they're trying to save that data as well but yes um i'm going to go back to the q a box um we're just probably looking at the time having two more questions i think probably um and this one's from una who's um have you got any suggestions maya for simple ways to digitize audio recordings in-house rather than uh, mm. someone else to do them well um again i point to those two zines produced by the unlocking sound heritage um team which i mentioned in my talk but there is a link to them both so they talk about digitizing cassette tapes um and they also talk about um ripping audio from cds um, and they'll talk you through that process in much more detail um obviously i don't know what your original format is um but if you have things like open reel tape perhaps um you might want to speak to local sound engineers um so there's there is for example there's a guy in shetland who um has experience using that material and um was able to do that rather than directly going to a, a sort of an archive actually going to like audio engineers many actually many bands still use that kind of technology so um you might want to look at um that kind of thing so sometimes it's about thinking around the problem just as much as as um as uh kind of going it's it's an archive or it's archival material we got to look at the archival mm. system looking in the in the um sector that produced these recordings is also useful so um and maybe sort of um oh una's come back and said <laughs> What are the best cloud options if you have any? Oh, tricky, isn't it? Yes, uh, I guess it sort of relates again back to that um, Dropbox discussion earlier. Um, yeah. But again, I, you know, there's, there's a discussion to be between different systems. But again, that's, I guess it comes down to that three, two, one rule. And making sure your audio or your visual material is stored in different places and different formats so you're sort of protecting yourself against any potential uh, problems right and last i'm going to say is oops gosh so many that are coming in maya is in your experience maya what is the mm. most difficult part of digitization of sound and film collections um so obviously it depends whether you do it in-house or outsource it but i wouldn't actually say the actual process of doing it is difficult i think it's getting your head around um so some of the things we touched on like the codex what you're outputting to that like digital files aren't all the same um and also really importantly kind of thinking ahead and making sure you've got a system this is going to it's going to sound so boring but actually giving a system for like cataloging them because it's very easy to hold up your uh, your vhsc tape and go this is an item but when you've got a list of digital files you know what's what how do you match them together so really i know that's really boring but um that is i'd say my experience is that's that's the trickiest thing is actually managing all that data um in the process so but that's a bit boring <laughs> i say the most exciting thing is when you see that item fully digitized and uh you know it opens up so many possibilities and i, I only touched on a few really exciting projects but the fact that you can sort of chop things up obviously with permission or present them in new ways i think is really exciting so yeah thank you now, Maya, um, just to say that if uh, maybe there are some other questions, mm. uh, perhaps when I send out the other information, would you be happy for people to email you? 
Absolutely, yeah, that's fine. That we can put um, your email address. So um, just so that you don't, you're not disappointed that we, we've missed your question at all. Um, but we don't want to overrun too much um, and turn this into a much longer session um, than we planned. Um, I just want to say, Maya, thank you very, very much for today. It's been incredibly interesting. Um, you make it sound um, something that's very, very scary in my mind. You've made it sound quite accessible, if you like, and something that I can, I could actually do myself, um, which is really what, this, what it's all about. And I want to also say good luck because I know that you're handing in your PhD thesis, I think um, either today or tomorrow or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next time we speak, you will no longer be a PhD candidate. So <laughs> I very much look forward to that. Um, but uh, I just want to say thank you for today and thank you for everyone for attending. And I will be um, emailing you all very soon. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.